All right. We're making our way through the Psalms on Sunday nights together. Let me encourage you to open to Psalm 13. It is the next psalm in the songbook of Israel. It's where we find ourselves tonight. Let me open us in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. We thank you for putting David and other songwriters of ancient Israel through trials that provoked prayer that brought about faith. We're thankful that these have been recorded for us so that we can relate. Uh, these words resonate with our hearts. Lord, every heart comes here this evening with a different perspective on the spectrum of things going well or things going differently. And we all have the same need to look to you, our God, and to come to you in simple faith and trust you. We know that you have infinite resources to meet our needs. We believe that. And we ask for your help uh, with our small faith. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 13 begins with the question, how long, O Lord? How long, O Yahweh? This has been called the How Long Song by Charles Spurgeon. And it may resonate with you. The answer to the question in my home growing up was, won't be long now. That's what the squirrel said when he backed into the lawnmower, won't be long now. This was one of those phrases I grew up with. And the psalm here asks the question, how long, as the songwriter is in the midst of trial? Notice the ascription at the top. This again is part of the text for the choir director, a psalm of David. Uh, this was given to Israel as part of Israel's songbook. The choir director is given instruction to direct the people to sing these words. And it comes from the pen of David, who evidently was under some duress as he wrote this song. Let's read it together. How long, O Yahweh, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart all the day? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Look and answer me, O Yahweh my God. Give light to my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy says I have overcome him, and my adversaries rejoice that I am shaken. But I have trusted in your loving kindness. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to Yahweh because he has dealt bountifully with me. Can you relate to this psalm, the How Long song? By way of introduction, I have for you a diagram up on the screen. And this diagram is intended to depict where our hearts, our words, our minds are as we're dealing with trouble. And, and what you have on the right are enemies, and on the left, you have God. Down on the bottom set of lines, you've got despair on the right and faith on the far left. And, and these are sort of on poles for us. The, the situation of this psalm was David's experience with his enemies, who seemed to be on the rise, on the ascendancy, gaining influence. And when David had his words, on his enemies, his eyes on his enemies, his thoughts on his enemies, his heart on his enemies, he found himself in despair. Eyes on the situation, heart in despair. Those are on the same side of the diagram. On the opposite side of the diagram, you have words towards God, eyes towards God, thoughts towards God, my heart directed Godward. And on that same side of the diagram, you have faith. And, and what is it that moves us from one pole to the other, from having our eyes on our situation, in David's case in Psalm 13, his enemies, from having our eyes on our adverse situation to having our eyes on God? What is it that moves us from despair to faith? And in this psalm, it is prayer that moves the dial. That the, the brings the heart from one end of the spectrum to the other, that brings the thoughts from one end to the other. That is just maybe sort of a visual way to portray this psalm. In outline form, we'll talk this evening about moving my heart from despair 
through prayer to faith. We'll look at the the three sections of this psalm, and if you're looking at an English text, most likely it has been broken up into three paragraphs. Verses 1 and 2 are the paragraphs of despair. Verses 3 and 4 is prayer, and verses 5 and 6 is faith. We go from despair through prayer to faith. That is where this psalm moves us. Let's look at despair first. How long, O Yahweh, David sings, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart all the day? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? This series of questions presents the problem, and this problem is presented something like tumultuous waves of a stormy sea. Old Testament commentator Franz Dalish paints this psalm this way. He says, this song casts up constantly lessening waves until it becomes still as the sea when smooth as a mirror. And the only commotion discernible at last is that of the joyous ripple of calm repose. Sort of a dramatic way to describe the the feeling of the psalm. We, We begin with this barrage of questions, a tempestuous sea of despair. And the question is, how long, O Yahweh? This is a question of tension and anxiety. How long do I have to be in this situation? And the trouble sometimes in a trial is not knowing how long the trial will last. And that in itself is another trial. Have you ever been in a trial of undetermined length? I wore a wristwatch as a kid when I went to the dentist for the express purpose of knowing how long this was going to take. I had calculated in my mind that a dentist appointment was a finite period of time because someone else had an appointment after me. It had to end sometime. And knowing that it would be less than, say, an hour was a comfort to me as a kid. I can get through this. What time is it? Of course, the dental hygienist is asking you questions you can't answer except through garbled nonsense. But for me, the comfort was in my wristwatch. I know this can't last forever. If you have a trial and you don't know how long it's going to be, there's not an appointment for something else after the trial. That's an additional trial. How long, O Lord, is the expression of this tension? And David says, furthermore, will you forget me forever? We'll take these two ideas apart a little bit, forgetting and the forever. Let's look at the forever for a moment. What an awful consideration to think about forever in the context of a trial, a hardship. You're between a rock and a hard place, and this is just going to go on and on and on. Think of the last time you used the word forever. Can you remember it? Oh, I was in that line forever. For any trial to drag on interminably leads us to suspect it may never end. There's a helpful correction to that for us. Faith will land us there, but just think for a moment about Philippians 4.8. Think on what is true. My dentist appointment actually will not last forever. Uh, This line has to come to an end sometime. I'll either rot standing here or this business will go out of business or the doors will close and they'll kick me out. It actually won't last forever. There is some comfort in that. But you get the feeling that David is under serious distress, and he says, will you forget me forever? And and this question is troubling to his soul. Can God truly forget his people? Well, of course not. Spurgeon said, a hidden face is no sign of a forgetful heart. But David here clearly feels forgotten. He feels alone. The trial lingers, and we suspect that maybe we're lost in God's accounting. Have I slipped through the cracks? Am I unimportant? Well, you know, God's got to crack a few eggs to get his omelet. Maybe I'm just lost in the mix. The vocabulary of forgetting and remembering in your Old Testament is really important. Track these words. Remembering and forgetting in the Old Testament is not about mental cognizance. It's not about the awareness of facts. Remembering means to act on behalf of someone and and forgetting or, or feeling forgotten. 
is, is the language of sort of uh, covenant infidelity. The, the people of Israel are said to have forgotten Yahweh. It, it's not likely that they lost track of some facts of history. But in forgetting Yahweh and, and not remembering His promises, not remembering His warnings, not remembering their own obligations to covenant loyalty, meant not acting in faith and obedience to what He said. The thought that God would remember His people is so significant. Consider Exodus 2.24. God heard their groaning and God remembered His covenant with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Remembering on God's part, is his acting in favor in their behalf. It is a matter of hope for his people that God would do action for their benefit. And so the feeling of being forgotten of God is that there's no perceivable practical help, or at least not any that I can know about yet. Where is there something tangible that I can perceive so that I can know that God sees and he cares? That's what's behind David's question here. And he goes on, how long will you hide your face from me? And the face of God, uh, uh, the face of God is his, his countenance and his favor. And we have that by faith for now. It's the sense of God's close fellowship and, and his dispensing with us favorably. This thought was very precious to David. David was considered to be a man after God's own heart, and David's longing to see God's face actually reveals his love for God. He longed to see God. He longed to know God. He longed to love God and have fellowship with God and be in God's favor. Listen to David's words in Psalm eleven seven: Yahweh is righteous. He loves righteousness. The upright will behold his face. That's something David looked forward to. Psalm 27, 4, one thing I have asked from Yahweh and that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of Yahweh all the days of my life to behold the beauty of Yahweh and to meditate in his temple. And Psalm 27, 8, when you said, O God, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, O Yahweh, I shall seek. David's response to the gracious invitation that those who come to God in faith would see him was something that got David excited. And so to the degree that David sensed he was losing access to fellowship and favor was very disconcerting to him. He longed to see God. He longed to have his face. He, he longed, longed to have a sense that God was favorably disposed toward him. And notice he says in verse 2, How long shall I take counsel in my soul? Literally, it is, how long shall I be putting counsels inside my soul? How long will I go on putting thoughts in my brain, one after the other, so that they chase each other around inside of me? This is a question about recycled sorrows, a restless tumbling of mental meanderings, it's tumultuous in here, says David. In my poor soul, there is a frenzy of frenetic ideas that keeps me distracted and unsettled. Have you ever felt that way? Your innards are, are just sort of a, a, a shakable case of all kinds of thoughts just rattling around in there. Disturbing, unsettling, distracting. And he says... How long will I go about this, having sorrow in my heart all the day? Listening to yourself recycle sorrows is bad medicine. Regurgitating trouble makes for sour soup. There's no way to get out of the cycle of despair by listening to yourself. The sorrows just multiply. You take them down, you chew them over, you spit them back up, you take them down again, it gets worse and worse and worse in every cycle. David knows this by experience. And then he asks the question, how long will my enemy be exalted over me? Here we get to the situational position that David is in. Listen to David's question. Where are his eyes? His eyes are on his enemies. Where are his words? On the exaltation of his enemies. This is David's circumstance. 
The enemy is on the ascendancy. The ones who are hostile against him are on the rise. They're increasing. They're gaining successes. They're growing in their influence. They have the tactical advantage, and David feels it. And this is a double bummer for David. Not only is he in a trough of despair, but his enemies know it. And so his downcast state gives his enemies more boldness. As John Calvin points out in his commentary on this psalm, David's state gives his enemies the appearance that God must not be happy with David. And so they pounce. Things are going so poorly for David, God must be upset with them. And they are gleeful at his demise. Likewise, John, or Charles Spurgeon said, the laughter of a foe grates horribly upon the ears of David's grief. So David's heart is overwhelmed in these first two verses. And remember, as we've seen in the Psalms, that a personal crisis for David constituted a national crisis for Israel and a covenantal problem. David, as the placeholder of God's promises to Israel and a placeholder of God's promises to blessings for the whole world, if David's line is cut off, if he has no progeny to sit on the throne, then you and I have no hope of Messiah. This is a much bigger problem than a personal offense. In fact, this even rises to the level of a theological problem. If God's installed king goes down, will the nation suffer? Will God's promises fail? And so this even becomes a question of God's integrity and honor. And the questions that Dave poses in verses 1 and 2 will leave a man in despair if they do not lead him to prayer. You don't sit in verses 1 and 2. You don't sit and stew on these questions. You don't memorize Psalm 13, 1 and 2 alone. Despair to prayer to faith. Don't take these ones out of context. Tuck them away in your heart and meditate on them. David didn't stop there. That leads to prayer in verse 3. Look what he says. Look and answer me, O Yahweh my God. David had had the sense that God's face was hidden, so this request makes a lot of sense. Look, look my direction. Lord, turn your face toward me. This is prayer. This is the fundamental language of prayer. We talked about it a couple of weeks ago. Just help. <laughs> This is faith, meager as it is, meager as it may be at this point, looking upward and asking for assistance. Martin Luther said that the hope itself despairs, but despair nevertheless begins to hope. <laughs> this is a start. This is the seed of faith in desperate circumstance. And listen, if God had truly forgotten, then there would be no hope for prayer. You, you would just manage. You, you just pull up your bootstraps. You move on with life. You do the best you can. You grit your teeth. You grin and bear it. You think happy thoughts. What, whatever coping mechanism you have on a horizontal level, you are left to your own devices. Not David. This seed of faith points his eyes and his heart and his words Godward. Prayer itself is an act of faith. We turn to the only one who can help. It is the end of self-sufficiency. And really, that's where we need to be all the time. The old hymn was, I need thee every hour. You recognize your need all the time. We must learn to live dependently. It's so easy to set our eyes and our frame on a horizontal level and just live and say, I got this. Well, there is no, I got this in the life of faith. And you and I can willingly choose to live dependently, to recognize our need of God at every moment. Or sometimes God in his goodness to us uses trials to wrestle loose our white knuckle grip on self-sufficiency. We always need him. When you feel like you're in dire straits and when you don't, you, you always need him. And sometimes God helps us by trials to recognize it all over again. So David prays, look and answer me, O Yahweh, my God. He says next, give light to my eyes. Give light to my eyes. This is a Hebrew way of speaking about revival of life. 
The, the, the life flow is ebbing out of you. To enlighten the eyes was to bring back the vitality of life. Listen to 1 Samuel 14, 27. This is Jonathan, and he didn't know that his father Saul had put a ban on eating, and he hadn't heard, verse 27, that his father put people under an oath. Therefore, Jonathan put out the end of his staff that was in his hand, and he dipped it in the honeycomb. He put his hand to his mouth, and his eyes brightened. The eyes brightening is a way to say, I was famished. I thought I would faint. <laughs> Got some honey, whew, had a Snickers, a lot better now. That is the language here, give light to my eyes. It's, it's a revival of physical vitality. And then David adds, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Look, if, if God doesn't give light to my eyes, I'm going down. And, and literally, this phrase is fascinating. You may see some italicized words in your English text. The italics uh, does not mean in, in our English Bibles that a word is really important. It means that the English translators have added words to help us understand the meaning. If you take out the ital italics here, what do you have? Lest I sleep death, or lest I sleep, even literally in Hebrew, the death. It's like... I'm going to eat the orange. I'm going to kick the soccer ball. I'm going to sleep what? Sleep death. It's, it's emphatic. It's dramatic. It gives you a sense, a, a window into the dire straits that David felt himself in. Is his life in danger physically? Or has his emotional darkness become so great that death itself seemed near? Whatever the case... Uh, David felt like he was near the end and he needed help from Yahweh. And then he closes this prayer with, lest my enemy says, I have overcome him and my adversaries rejoice that I am shaken. Again, David's enemies are gleefully rejoicing at his demise and this was a sore grief to his heart. So he calls out to God for help. And what if there were no help? What if David truly was left to his own devices? What if there were no hope, no Yahweh, no covenant, no grace? But prayer here turns the tide of sorrow and settles the tumult of anxiety. Because prayer gets us to faith, which lifts the curtain of despair to reveal the light of God's face. And that's what we see in the final section of this psalm. Look at verse 5. But I have trusted in your loving kindness. This last section is faith. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to Yahweh because he has dealt bountifully with me. Listen, we, we were just about to die in the previous paragraph, and now we're singing. What happened? Circumstance didn't change. But we have the classic turn in the psalm. What got us from despair to faith? meager seed, faith, exercised in prayer, God, help, and God helps. The circumstance hasn't changed. The, the, the outward realities of David's enemies have not gone away. But David's heart is up, his eyes are up, his words are up, and he's looking at God rather than his enemies. He says, but I have trusted in your loving kindness. Uh, this is a contrast from what has gone before. A and the turn brought about through prayer brings about an emphatic subject. He is saying, I myself have trusted. This is personal for David. You see, David's experiences with life and faith are not empty religious platitudes. He feels it and he means it. It comes out in the way he expresses it. They are deeply felt, truly experienced victories of faith in dire circumstances. And he says, I have trusted. That is, he has believed God. He has believed God and entrusted himself to God. What does trust look like when you're a kitten in a tree and the friendly neighborhood fireman has his arms extended? Retract the claws and let yourself be gently brought to the ground. I don't know if a kitten's ever actually done that with a fireman. What does it look like for you to trust the Lord in your trial? 
retract the clause, trust the Lord, a belief in the goodness of God, a belief in the power of God, a welcoming of God's timing and a welcoming of God's methods. Entrusting yourself to Him means a yielded will, ready to obey whatever God would direct. That's what David expresses here. It's, it's simple faith. I trust God and I entrust my outcomes to God. I entrust my life to God. I let go and let myself be carried by his goodness. And notice what he directs our hearts towards. Grace. I have trusted in your loving kindness, he said. That's the Old Testament word, that precious word. That means grace is covenant love. God's commitment to faithfully love his own. Can God truly forget his people? Is he really absent? Is his face really gone? No, none of that's possible. Philippians 4, 8, the expression of faith means we think on what is true. God loves me and God is here, says the believer. We think on revelational truth rather than emotional musings, the cycles of sorrow and the meandering thoughts. He says, my heart shall rejoice in your salvation. In verse 5, getting down to the very core of his being, he, he personifies his inner man and says, my heart's going to go after some things. It's going to rejoice. And it's going to rejoice in salvation. And I think there's a threefold idea that David has in mind here. He, he's rehearsing things of the past, past graces, recounting surprising times in the past where God showed up and dealt favorably with me. And it means rejoicing in the present. Uh, I'm not currently getting what I actually deserve, no, no matter how bad the rock and the hard place is. I, I have some idea of what I deserve, and I'm not getting that. I'm still experiencing the benefits of God's covenant love in my life. And then in the future, a grace that goes beyond our wildest dreams. David later in Psalm 1611 will see at God's right hand, our pleasures forevermore. A window into David's eternal hope in the goodness and the grace of God expressed into eternity future. And so David says, I will sing to Yahweh. You could translate this as, I must sing to Yahweh. There, there's no way around it. I've gone from despair through prayer to faith, and now that faith's just got to come out in expression, and in David's case, in song. And when you and I get together to sing, we, we do this very thing. We bring our different expressions, our different experiences of God's dealings with us. I don't know where you're at on the spectrum of the diagram we looked at earlier. You might be on the side of despair. You might be in a difficult spot and you don't know the way out and you're wondering how long it's going to be. Perhaps you show up on a Sunday morning hanging on to a hope of help and you're uttering those feeble prayers. Dear Lord, don't even know what to say next, but I'm looking up. I'm feebly asking for help. And maybe you come on a Sunday morning or a Sunday night with your heart just filled with the remembrances of Yahweh's salvations. It's a familiar word here, this word for salvation. It is Yeshua. It's a wonderful word. Yahweh saves. It's the name that God gave to his own son in his earthly ministry, Yeshua or Jesus and maybe you show up on a Sunday just full of heart thinking about Jesus and all that he's done for you. And what do we do when we gather together and sing? We, we have the opportunity to strengthen, strengthen one another's faith as we sing to each other. We recount past graces and present graces and future graces. Why do we do all of this together? Why is David's psalm of despair to prayer to faith in the songbook? Last line in verse 6, because he has dealt bountifully with me. Bountifully, generously, in excess. And when our words and our eyes and our thoughts and our hearts are on our circumstances, we will wind up in despair. 
By prayer, our words and our eyes and our thoughts and our hearts move Godward, and we experience the blessings of the fullness of faith. You know, it's actually God's good intention that we live in this tension. If the title of this song resonates with you, the How Long Song, How Long, O Lord? This is a refrain that resonates throughout the Scriptures. We, we find it from beginning to end. It, it shows up in the book of Revelation, even for those saints in glory who are waiting for the vindication of the glory of God and just retribution against their enemies. Listen, they, they are home free, and they are still asking the question, How long, O Lord? It's God's good intention that we live in this tension. Our goal is not to get out of it. This is a tension soothed by prayer and eased by faith. But as long as we are in this world, as long as things have not been wrapped up to the new heavens and the new earth where there is no more curse, no more sorrow, no more sin, no more death, then we will say, how long, O Lord? And there is an answer, different than the answer I gave you at the beginning. Won't be long now. That's what the squirrel said when he backed into the lawnmower. Won't be long now. There is an answer to the question, how long, O Lord? And it is a finite answer. There is a finite number of moments still out ahead of us until everything is set right. There is a finite number of trials. There is a fixed history. How much longer will it be? I don't know. But God knows, and He's good. And it actually will be very short, very, very short, nearly immeasurably short. When you do the math on the comparison between eternity future and any finite period of time, it's just incomparable. And it is mathematically appropriate for us to say, very soon we will have been longer with our Savior, having forgotten our trials. We will have been longer there than we've been here very soon. We're burdened here. And Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that we don't experience anything except what is common. And there's always a way of escape. And we find out in the book of Hebrews that we have a sympathetic high priest in the Lord Jesus Christ, who came, lived in the flesh, suffered under the the difficulties of being a finite human being in a broken world. He never sinned, so he didn't have to suffer the consequences of his own sin. But he did suffer the consequences of other people's sins. And of course, he carried the burden of justice for all the sins of everyone who would ever believe as our substitute. And as our faithful high priest, he deals gently with us because he knows our frame he knows what we walk through, and in his shepherding goodness, he has us here for a short time. Let's pray. How long, O oh Lord? We know not, but you know, and you are good, and you care, and you love your own, and your face is not turned away though it seems that way to us at times. You have not forgotten. You could not forget. You will never forget your own. You are bound to us by covenant love. You have covenanted with yourself to be faithful to your own glory and your own purposes and your own plan. And you have purchased with your own blood all those who are redeemed. And we are yours forevermore. Let us not forget. We pray, even as we sing, that our hearts would be encouraged, that our faith would be strengthened until the day you take us home. In Jesus' name, amen.